Good afternoon and uh, welcome to this edition of the Insurance Journals Academy of Insurance's weekly webinar series after show. Uh, I have to think of a shorter <laughs> title for that, but uh, every time <laughs> the camera comes on, that's what I that's the that's what rolls past my marquee. Uh, uh, so um, welcome everybody. And uh, this is the after show for our webinar, An Hour with Kevin, Fix My Blankety Blank, whatever you wanna put in that, uh, in that series of characters, a uh, commercial property policy webinar. Um, and uh, this is also a treat for you after show uh, mavens that only happens on um, the full moon equivalent of broad daylight because uh, we have this week, uh, alongside myself and the director of the Academy, Mr. Patrick Great, uh, today's instructor, Mr. Kevin Amrine. So welcome, Kevin, to the after show. We're happy to have you here. Pleasure. You mentioned the full moon thing. I thought you were going to go for like a, like a, like a Wolfman reference or like a, a lycanthropic uh, or so, something there. But uh, sure. I've no, seen hey, a beard I, like that since Teen Wolf. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when they wrote insurance in Romania against um, attacks by various monsters. I'm sure there was some kind of lycanthropic um, <laughs> endorsement that have been added to a policy, I'm guessing. I don't know. Uh, yeah, it's good. It's good to be here with you guys. It's always fun to banter with, uh, <laughs> with some fellow insurance, insurance guys. It's, it's, you're obviously great to work with. So, hey, let's, let's party. Let's do it. All right. Wait, uh, what, I'm here. So the, the new, normally, you know, I, for me, uh, when a webinar happens, there's, there isn't, there's always, this seems to me in the back of my mind, like there's gotta be, have been a need for this webinar to have happened, uh, for the topic to be serious enough to address and devote, uh, classes to it. Um, so for me, it seems like the, the need for this to talk about these gaps in commercial property policy and how it's broken and, and what you need to do to fix it. I mean, is it are is every commercial property policy this way like how rampant is the lack of coverage that is given by a, 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 a like a producer or someone in sales to an insured like is that on epidemic level in terms of um the need to address these issues in your experience kevin or that's a good question. I, I, I locally, uh, it's, I think the answer is a little different. Um, I'm, I'm in the great state of Florida and, uh, I feel very fortunate most, most of the time for that. There are some things uh, about uh, our state that, uh, uh, are not ideal. Um, one of which would be our property insurance situation, which is very understandable. Uh, it's not a, it's not a great place to, to be if you're uh, trying to uh, get property insurance and it's a very difficult place to sell property insurance. So in my neck of the woods, I think that these issues that I discuss in that, in that webinar are much more relevant. I, I do talk about ISO form language and ISO is, is broad, I would, I would say, compared to what you see out there in a, in a, in a harder market, especially in a market like Florida. I will say that if you can find good property markets and there are in Florida, there are insurance companies that write respectable cover. It's not impossible. Uh, and in other parts of the country, you'll have uh, premium packs. You'll have these proprietary additions to the ISO form language that will enhance the coverage, make it a little bit better than what I talk about in this class, you know, debris removal, you'll get a little bit more money. Uh, maybe a broader interpretation of covered property. Uh, so I wouldn't say that, that it's as limited or as dire as I try to make it sound when I, when I teach property insurance, but I'm also talking from a place of, hey, look, the property policy you're probably forced to sell isn't very good. And these are some issues that when I teach property insurance to agents in Florida and also in other parts of the country, this is where the hand, these, these are the places the hands come up and people say, all right, hang on a second, say that again, you know? So you just kind of put together a program based on some of the more common uh, issues. Nothing I discuss in the class in this particular class is I would say cutting edge or new. It's, it's, they're all issues that have been in the policy for a long time, but people still don't quite 
understand them. And I think part of that is because I'm very used to dealing with people who work in very hard property markets. Mm -hmm. They're not, you know, they're not even getting the equivalent to the ISO form, much less something broader. So, you know, that's, that's really the catalyst for it. I, I think there's always, there's always issues with property insurance that people just aren't clear on. It's like, you can't teach it enough. Right. So you mentioned that um, these are policies that agents are forced to sell. So uh, they, they never buck the system and suggest to their powers that be that they add some of these things that need to be on policies or suggested to the insureds, but aren't like, it, it's really a case of them being made to sell these policies, even though there are the gaps and everything like that. Yeah. I, well, you know, I so filed and approved, I mean, the, the, the forms get, uh, get approved by regulators for widespread use. And so the, the, these are seen as the broadest policies out there without some kind of enhancement endorsement or something that it, again, in some cases, a carrier would automatically include, uh, and you know, nobody wants to think about having too restrictive of coverage on something like removal of debris or, uh, vacancy being so strictly interpreted and uh, puts a lot of pressure on the insurance companies, puts a lot of pressure, obviously on the agents, on the insureds. Right. I, I would hope that every agent who listens to that webinar could say, my insurance companies all do better than this. And, and I'm glad to know that I, I can sleep a little better knowing I'm in good hands. Still probably need to consider you know, the limitations here, but, but I, the good news is I, I'm doing better than this. I think other agents are going to listen to the presentation and say, I've tried to get better coverage and can't, nobody will give it to me. So, you know, maybe some of these endorsements that Kevin talks about in his presentation, maybe if I specifically go looking for those, you know, talk to a broker and say, here's my, here's my gap. Do you have an endorsement like this? Maybe, you know, maybe I can change who I do business with. I don't know. Uh, I, I think that when the gap exists in the ISO form, then uh, it's pretty common. And uh, if, uh, if we've, we, you know, if we got an easy solution for it and the agent can just ask and there it is, then that's great. But they still need to know it's there. Especially, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you something like, something like removal of debris, I keep going back to that one, or something like the definition of covered property. I feel like, and I teach it this way, if you think about it from the insured's perspective, sure. an insured is always going to assume that something like the cost to remove debris that was created by a covered loss is included. That's just something insurance is going to pay for. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's how the insured's, and I don't think that's an unreasonable, illogical conclusion. Same with definition of covered property and property not covered you'll see things on that list like contraband. Okay, it's, it's not hard to tell an insured, don't turn in a claim for your closet full of illegal drug making paraphernalia, you know, and, and have them act like they're surprised. They can't get money for that. But a fence, a parking lot, a foundation of a building that's damaged, I just think that logically speaking, people assume that that's all included and clearly it's not if you don't have a bop or something really broad, so. And Kevin, you you know you you've, you've gone back to that uh, that debris removal thing, and you know there are a lot of risks out there, a lot of buildings where uh, their particular debris removal issue is going to be a whole lot more expensive than the you know the accountant's office that's in a strip mall. I mean, you you got we you were you brought up uh, the example of a dentist chair talking about the dent the chair being part of the building or or whether it's personal property possibly insurable possible, as, right? as, as a yeah. building property. Yeah. And, and those, you know, a, a dentist, you know, one of the things that we don't often think about, but you know, most dentist offices have got an x-ray machine and that yeah. just the presence of an x-ray machine could increase the debris removal expense incredibly just because they got some kind of radioactive material, radioactive materials there. And, um, and I think you're, you're right. I think that that's a, a great philosophy, a great way to look at it with that from the insured's perspective. The, the insured, when they, when they come to a loss, they're going to say, of course, my insurance is going to pay to get rid of all this stuff because you've got to get rid of all this broken stuff before you rebuild my building. Of course, you, you'd pay for that. And then you, to be on the other side of the table to say, well, actually, 
there's not really enough money. You're going to have to go take out a personal loan or, or try and find another $10,000. I mean, that, it can be real pricey. Oh yeah. That, that issue is one we can spend hours on. I, there's so many claims examples of yeah. businesses that just got blasted with huge bills from uh, removal companies, particularly in the wake of widespread loss, like a hurricane, for example. Sure. Uh, you, I had a, I, and, and you hear things from agents that you never contemplated. I mean, I, I've read all kinds of claims examples, claim stories, but this guy in, in a class that I taught not too terribly long ago, uh, told me about, and I don't remember the exact nature of the manufacturing facility that he insured, but they had a lot of paper products. And he mentioned that there was a fire in, in the building, caused a significant amount of damage, that uh, when the suppression system was able to finally uh, save a, a good chunk of the structure, a lot of the personal property was ruined because of the fire suppression system, the sprinkler system. And the saturated personal property and the saturated paper products, because they were saturated, so significantly increased the cost of debris because because it uh, I think he he described uh, some paper products that uh, quadrupled in weight and quadrupled in mass due to the saturation so sure. something like that you you would never think of exponentially increased the cost to remove the debris yeah. you know as opposed to just okay there's a pile of wood there that used to be a frame building let's get the wood out of here mm -hmm. and oh by the way if the cost to have a service come out with a bunch of grapple trucks to get rid of it is too high. We're just going to hire some teenagers or we're going to hire some young guy or we're going to hire some, you know, some, some guys and, and, and give them some gloves and some shovels and some beers and say, you know, how many weekends you got free, go, you know, go clean up all that stuff and get it out of here. And I don't care what you do with it. Right. It's, it's such an expensive thing. And then, you know, it's only one example. I mean, we talked sure. about the vacancy issue. We talked about, landscaping and businesses that spend tens of thousands of dollars sure uh improving the the curb appeal of it, an office park a hotel a restaurant you know a dentist office something like that they want people to come in there and and feel comfortable relax beautiful trees and shrubs and and that stuff goes, man, and you start pricing the cost to fix it or replace it, and all of a sudden, the insured looks at it and says, what, how is this not covered by my property? I have, right. I have fire insurance, don't I? Right. Well, the, all of this was because of a fire. Mm -hmm. and, now, and now you're telling me, okay, yeah, but there's a limit here, there's but. a limit there, there's a limit here, there's a limit there. It's very frustrating. Or you've got, uh, as happens here, you've got a uh, storm comes by and – blows over half of the water oaks in the uh on the property of course we i think we have established that kevin has a hate hate relationship with the water oak oh it's wretched I'm, i got that vibe <laughs> <laughs> i had about i had probably seven mature very mature water oaks come down in hurricane michael in october 2018 Ooh. And, you know, I, I live in Tallahassee, Florida. We, we didn't get the worst of that storm. We, we yeah. had probably Cat 1, Cat 2 conditions here. I, nothing like what they had, what our neighbors to the west experienced. Uh, but uh, I had uh, I got a lot of trees in my yard, a bunch of pines. Those were the ones I was worried about. My front yard's full of pine trees. I was staring out the front the whole time saying, man, when is one of those things going to come down? Not one of our pine trees was, was lost. Not one of them. Mm -hmm. But all of these oak trees came down. Sure enough. And I just thought, what is this all? What's, how does that happen? Yeah. And now, then I learned. <laughs> were, they, were they old enough to have kind of hollowed out in the middle there? I didn't think so. I, I certainly didn't think so. And the guys that came and cut them up for us, you know, uh, you, don't want, you don't want me near a chainsaw. Let's just, <laughs> let's just say, and, and, and if some people watching this are thinking, oh, he had to hire people just to cut the trees. Yes, yes. everybody. <laughs> Yes, I had a cert I had some people come and do that because I trust me. I know like there are men, a lot of them who have beards like mine, who would like live for this opportunity to go and just chainsaw trees up after a storm. The guys that were cutting the trees up were baffled. They just they said, "How did you? How did so many of these come down?" I, like, I don't know. Maybe we had a little rotation, you know, clip the clip the back of our property. I don't know, but but we lost. Uh, 
a bunch of those things and they were, they're very expensive to get rid of. Uh, anyway, so there you go. Yeah. Just luckily we didn't have any, da- none of my trees damaged my home. So that was obviously very fortunate, but just using that as an example of something that's very likely to happen after a mm-hmm. storm and, you know, having to pay to get this stuff off the property. I did, I didn't even get into how severely limiting the property policy is on certain types of debris like trees. I did mention right. in the webinar that the policy is pretty clear. It needs to be of the type that would be covered property. Sure. And then the policy then goes on to say tree shrubs and plants are not covered property. So maybe somebody made the connection there, but it just, it just, it's it just the things that you, you know, things you just don't, you don't think about until they happen. And right. You know, there you go. In, in that vein, I wanted to ask you, my other question to you is um, you talked about uh, uncovered, you know, like fire, things. Like, what, what is the weirdest, uh, most unusual uncovered peril or, you know, whatever that you've, you've heard about that befell an insured that they had trouble <laughs> with a claim on? I, was it a, it, have you ever heard a combination of a two? Um, is there a, a threefold event that you've heard about that no. in conjunction to... <laughs> infestation that's the, that's the, that's the uh, of experience infestation Kevin? infestation rodent infest animal related loss that you know not not i i have never personally experienced the infestation loss that was so extreme that it it totaled the building uh, you know i there i know there's people out there that'll tell you stories about that um but when you read when you read about claims caused by families of rodents animals that get into attics and reproduce and reproduce and reproduce and the next thing you know the place is full of bats or it's full of you know and the, uh, there is bona fide property damage not not to mention a potential health exposure but i mean bona fide property damage with significant remediation costs every time i hear about an example of that happening i i it it still surprises me uh, but uh, you're going to have a real hard time finding coverage for that. Uh, if there's a there's plenty of other things out there that happen. You know, um, is obviously a lot of talk about COVID and 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 so forth these days being the catalyst for a lot of property losses that aren't going to be covered. Prob- who knows? Maybe some of them will. I we still yeah. don't know. Oh, we yeah. don't think. I wouldn't expect them to be covered. But you know, every every time I try to tell people, every try, time I try to answer a question about that uh maybe some jurisdiction proves me wrong but i would say as far as the the most unusual it's not really unusual for any type of infestation that's not really unusual but every time i see that happen i think how could i I know the theory is that this is a maintenance issue but sometimes you just can't you ain't going to keep these beasts of the wild away from your structure. You're not going to keep them out of your, you're not going to keep them out of your building. And when they get in there, they're going to do what animals do and it's gross mm-hmm. and yeah. it's going to be expensive. And a lot of times I think people expect coverage for that and very rarely do they get it. Yeah, that's, that's one. Um, what, coastal properties often have an issue of what's the line between the wind damage and the water damage. And uh, yeah, sure. You know, we've, I've, I've, known some claims folks even that were dealing with it in their own homes where they were, they were working with the claims adjuster to figure out, okay, what, what, what's the water damage? What's the wind damage? And where are we going to, which policy is going to pay? Thankfully that that particular one, they had a, happened to have a flood policy as well, but you know, they're, they're dealing with two different insurance policies, two different causes of loss and one's, one's excluded, one's not. And getting all of that worked out, that's complicated. Very much so. I, I, I've dealt with that many, many, many times. That, that very issue uh, many times, and I've seen a lot of outcomes. I, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it, it's, it's, I, it's one of those things that I guess, I guess has improved a little bit over the years. It, from my perspective, I know in the wake of Katrina, we had a lot of uncovered losses, and you know, a lot of folks were real up in arms about that. Maybe that had something to do with it. I don't know, but yeah, wind and, and water, obviously uh, you've got, uh, we could spend hours type hours. Of folks, folks who, you know, talk about fire versus vandalism and 
you know, if, if, if what's what and you know, uh, ensuing losses being covered or not covered for uh, anti-concurrent causation, all kinds of all real fun property insurance stuff. But for, for George, you know, for the inquiry of what do you see happening that seems unusual that it's, I guess I interpret, unusual that there's not a better or a cleaner insurance solution. I would say, I would say claims involving some type of infestation or animal related damage. It's just, you see that happen so often. You would think it would be a pretty easy thing to fix, but oh well, <laughs> they're taking over, man. They're taking over. I'll tell you, we had, we had in my old office, a major issue with rodent infestation. And the amazing thing was, none of the exterminators could find the bodies. These things were getting in the building somehow and they were dying, which is a terrible story. This is not uplifting at all. Everybody's very depressing. I think they were squirrels. I don't know. Something was getting in the building and, 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 and they, they weren't getting out and they were dying in the building because the building just had this horrible scent. You know, you could tell it was something bad was going on. And, the resulting insects, you know, that were now all of a sudden in the bill. So I, I, I never turned in a claim or anything to try to pay for any of the, the extermination crews or anybody that tried to remediate this, which they were unsuccessful. You know, when an exterminator crew tells you, you're just going to have to let this thing run its course. That is not. <laughs> that is. That's not what you wanted to hear. Not a good answer. You're just going to have light some candles, brother. It's going to get worse before it gets better. You know, when you start hearing that from an exterminator who's been crawling under your building and all through the attic and everything, uh, we, we just moved. We moved to another. We needed to move to a different office anyway. But uh, that, you know, I've had an up close and personal experience with how that very, I mean, there was, there was bona fide property damage caused and furniture that was going to have to be replaced, carpet that would have to be replaced, miserable, terrible stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, the owner of the building is not going to find any coverage for that. So that's one example. I don't know if I want to hear any more. Uh, you know, that's, that's, <laughs> that'll tide me over for a while, I think. Um, so uh, a lot uh, of the show audience. So if you, if anyone wants to ask Kevin more questions, please do so. But I'm, I'm all set with that one. You've had <laughs> enough. Yeah, thanks. I'm trying to keep it light. <laughs> not sure. that anybody who's ever lost a property because of it i try to keep it light there's so yeah it's, it's insurance man it's just yeah any any insurance. policy underwritten underwritten by a votive candle you know it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't necessarily you know <laughs> it's a it's a hard business it's a it's a rough business it's great very rewarding obviously mm -hmm. we all know that but uh you know yeah it's hard to keep it light sometimes oh yeah uh, Patrick, this isn't a debate, but I wanted to give you the final word. That was my, uh, I, if I had any other questions, that was my last one. Uh, but I, do, I didn't have any other. So did you have any other questions for Kevin or anything? Um, the, webinar you wanted the, to only, the only thing is I, I, was, um, I was excited we were going to hit on ordinance or law, but uh, by the time we got to it, I mean, it's had to truck right through it. Is there, yeah. it, it would, if you could give us two minutes on ordinance or law, somebody who's used to talking for two plus hours at a shot. Here we go. Give us two minutes on ordinance or law or less. Why is it important? Who should have it? Every owner of every building should have it. Um, I won't even get into how it could benefit uh, tenants who invest in improvements and things because there's a bunch of different angles there. I will tell you that I, I think most people understand at its core what the purpose of ordinance or law is. Uh, I think a mistake that a lot of insurance folks make is they sell it incorrectly. Yeah. So you get it in your head that the main selling point of something like an ordinance or law endorsement is for code compliance upgrades for outdated, you know, think structural items in a building that are outdated, electrical, plumbing, uh, old glass, whatever it is. And so we, we tend to look at it as something that only benefits owners of older buildings that have been grandfathered in you know, building codes don't apply, et cetera. Right. But I, I, I think it's important that agents realize it's not just something you sell to somebody with an older building 
and say, look, you're going to have all these required upgrades when you have a loss. So why not get this insurance to help you pay for it? Owners of newer structures, code compliant structures need to consider, strongly consider sure. ordinance or law coverage because of things like 50% or more fire damage codes. So if, if you go into the office or Zoom or however people are going to communicate for the next whatever, if you tell the owner of a newer building, hey, you need to spend money on this endorsement because it's going to help pay for required code upgrades if you have a loss, the, the owner of the building is going to say, we, we, we just got the OC, you know, the CO on this thing like six months ago. It, it, the, the building's brand new. So what do I, what do I need this for? Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, okay. Because if I had a significant loss and then I was subjected to the enforcement of an ordinance at the time of the loss, that could cost the equivalent of half of my building for crying out loud. So coverage wise, I, there's plenty of different things you could talk about. I do, again, I, I do think most insurance people, at least at a core, understand the purpose of the endorsement. But I, the error that I see is, is that too many agents just, they latch on to maybe the wrong part of it. And then, I agree. And then give up when, say, the owner of a newer building doesn't want to spend the money. And I, I, that's why I feel like what's so important is it's got to be presented to everybody. I it may agree. take a little more arm twisting for, you know, somebody with a newer so, building, for example, yeah. just in two minutes, that's about the best I can do. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, and that was probably longer than two minutes. <laughs> I, I, I wasn't watching, <laughs> but it, it, you're right. I mean, it's, it is, it is more than just the upgrades. It's the, it's the, you know, value of the undamaged portion. It's the debris removal yeah. of all that undamaged, of all that undamaged portion. All that's an, a, an uncovered loss or, or a, a self-insured loss if there's a significant damage to the building. Uh, one last, one last thought. Uh, Kevin is wearing what I think is my favorite t-shirt now. Uh, he had, he, on his YouTube channel, he was wearing this one of his promotional videos. Can't read that. Florida is America's mullet. I mean, I, I don't even have anything else to say to that. It's just true. Hey, party, man. It's a party. <laughs> Uh, that's lazy. I don't lazy party lazy party rough. I, I don't know how we would describe that, but, uh, but yeah, no, man, it's, uh, I, I have, uh, I have my offices in Tallahassee. I've lived all over the state of Florida. There is never a dull moment. The humanity in, in this state on display is there is never a dull, never moment. A dull moment. I'll just leave it. I'll just leave <laughs> yeah. it there. And, um, Kevin, give us your website for uh, the Florida Insurance School of CE. Sure. Uh, our uh, website, uh, our webpage is FISCE.com. F like Florida, I S like Sam, CE.com. Uh, all of our webinars are obviously available for Florida licensees to uh, uh, register directly. Um, we have an entity called the CE Partnership where we have uh, our webinars, the Florida webinars uh, broadcast in other states for CE. All of our partners in those other states are uh, trade associations, professional agents associations, independent agents associations. So if there's something on the Florida website that a person looks at and thinks is really interesting, but maybe they don't have a Florida license, contact the uh, independent or professional insurance agents association in your state and uh, it may be available for CE uh, to you as well. And Kevin, we'll be seeing you again at the end of August. Um... Uh, booze. What's the what's the next topic you're going to be uh, teaching us about at the end of? Oh, our... I don't remember. There's so much. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. So much about booze. Uh, that's a uh, that's a webinar I I put together about uh, a couple of uh, liquor liability related issues, uh, businesses, kind of new businesses springing up that are getting into the business getting into the business of selling alcohol and some of the uh, coverage risks that, that that come along with that so it's just a, an hour on uh, essentially liquor liability and uh, why uh, more businesses probably need it than people think got it and that will count for an hour of ce as well i believe so 
Uh, Florida Patrick, licensees. Yeah. For, right, for licensees. I beg your pardon. Um, and Patrick, next week's webinar is uh, Frank Panaccio, Workers' Compensation uh, Insurance Basics. Yeah, we're really, really excited. First time we've gotten gotten uh, somebody to do a basic level workers' comp course. So we're we're excited just for, for folks to be able to get that kind of insurance 101 level. What is workers' comp? Why do we have it? Where did it come from? And, uh, and uh, why is it that some folks need it and some folks don't apparently and uh, and all of the the real basic level stuff so this is gonna be a good time and frank is an excellent instructor as well we, we appreciate him coming in to do that too for us sure and that's frank panaccio great um thanks patrick um kevin thanks again for your uh help and expertise and time today and for wearing that shirt and um, we look forward to uh, seeing you again in August. And uh, on behalf of our director, Patrick Grade, and myself, I'd like to say thanks, everybody, for coming to the after show. And um, we will see you uh, next week for the Insurance Journals Academy of Insurance weekly webinar series.